It gives me great pleasure to introduce this webinar as the start of our learning design seminar and workshop led by Professor Gronje Canole, Director of the Institute of Learning Innovation at University of Leicester, UK. Um, Gronje has been um, doing leading and highly innovative work around learning design and many different aspects of e-learning for at least the last past um, 15 years. And um, she's supported by Yolanda Morkel, who's a senior lecturer in architecture at CPUT, Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, South Africa. And we know um, Yolanda very well from the, the workshop that she co-led earlier with Daniela on um, digital storytelling and also from her sterling work in online facilitation in the Emerge 2012 conference and beyond then. So there's an opportunity here for us to learn a lot from Gronje and the models of design that she's developed over the last several years and also to bring that immediately into the design of our own courses or learning events. Gronje and Yolanda, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Tony, uh, for that kind introduction <clears throat> and the perfect pronunciation of my name. Um, welcome, everyone. Really, really looking forward to today's session and to our interactions over the next few weeks. I really hope you find um, the resources you're going to engage with useful and would very much welcome feedback. Lots of ways in which you can interact, obviously via the chat box here, and as Tony says, it's been recorded. But also there's a Facebook uh, page you can join, and um, there's the Emerge um, uh, forum as well. So hopefully um, you've got yourself into groups. If you haven't done so already, we would urge you to join a group in terms of co-designing something. Um, the seven C's of learning design, which I'm going to outline today, is a bit of a pun on C as in the sea. Um, and the pictures there you can see on the front page are of a boat called Sea Scamp, which um, is a 1930s wooden sailing boat, which was owned by the Luftwaffe uh, to teach the navigational skills between the wars. Um, and I'm actually going sailing on her this weekend, so I'm looking forward to that very much. So <coughs> uh, just on the next page, uh, if you haven't done so already, and I don't think many people have, um, Say a little bit about yourself on the forum or on the Facebook page. I know quite a few people have posted something on the Facebook page. And then just add reflections as and when as we go through. Um, so uh, just to give you an outline of what we're going to cover, um, today's session is mainly going to be an overview of the seven C's of learning design framework. And then there are uh, essentially seven activities we'd like you to engage with. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a chance to do the how to rule a course exercise today. But then we'd like you to complete the others uh, asynchronously in your team over the coming weeks. And we'll have uh, a follow-up session. I think it's the 15th of May, um, which will be a chance to reflect on what you've learned in your experience and uh, sharing uh, your thoughts on the workshop over the uh, coming weeks. So <clears throat> to give you a starting point, I think, and I posted this in the forum, I think my interest in learning design stems right back to my own initial experience of becoming a lecturer. Uh, I started lecturing in 1990 as a lecturer in chemistry. I just completed my PhD in chemistry. And when I started, I had absolutely no experience of teaching whatsoever. This, this, this was in the days before there were professional practice courses, academic practice courses that lecturers could do. So all I had was my own experience of being a learner, which is primarily through lectures, tutorials, and uh, laboratories. And I was comfortable with the content. And I kind of held on to that, um, but was quite bewildered about where to start. And I think that's a common experience for many new lecturers. Um, if you add into the mix the fact that we now have a, a kind of amazing variety of technologies that um, we can use to enable learners to interact with rich uh, interactive um, multimedia, to enable them to communicate and collaborate. It really is quite daunting for lecturers or for academics to think about where to start. And the other thing we know 
is that despite the fact that there are kind of plethora of ways in which um, students can interact with um, new technologies, through new technologies rather, and communicate and collaborate. And there are also now a wealth of free resources and tools. We've got open education resources. Of course, we've got um, masses and masses of uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses. Despite this, uh, they're not being fully exploited. In fact, we're practically just scratching the surface of what these technologies can do. And we've seen lots of examples of bad pedagogy, simply kind of putting up static materials online. And if you ask teachers why they're not using technologies more, and we did, we've done some research in this area, uh, they say they haven't got the time and they haven't got the skills. So this problem is at the heart of um, learning design, which is the research field that's emerged over the last 10 years or so, primarily driven by people in Europe and um, in uh, Australia. <clears throat> so what is learning design? There are a number of aspects to it. Firstly, it's about providing guidance to academics to help them make informed mm. design decisions that are pedagogically effective and make appropriate use of new technologies. And some of the mm -hmm. tools you'll be engaging with over the coming weeks uh, will help you see that. It enables teachers to think beyond content to the actual activities and the learner experience. <clears throat> it's also about visualization, and James DL, who's one of the leading people in learning design research, um, makes a nice analogy with music um, in the sense of um, can we get to a learning design representation, a learning design language. And he argues mm -hmm. that musical notation uh, only emerged uh, a few hundred years ago. Before that, <clears throat> music was passed on from person to person. <laughs> by mouth, essentially, and there was lots of um, uh, loss of the kind of originality. And when um, music notation emerged and became standard, it enabled a piece of music from 100 years ago to be replicated perfectly, not only in terms of the notes, but also in terms of emotion and pace, etc. And so what we're trying to do, um, the person I mentioned is, uh, is James D.L., uh, he's got a funny surname. I'll just type it in the box for you. Um, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's the guy behind what's called the learning management system. Uh, LAMS. LAMS, rather, not LAMS, learning management system. Uh, so it's about what we're interested in is uh, providing ways in which people can <clears throat> visualize the design process beyond content. And you'll have a chance to engage with a range of visualizations over the next few weeks. And finally, it's about sharing. Again, when we asked academics what would help them make more appropriate and effective use of technologies, they said, me, <clears throat> they said show me what others have done, in my, preferably in my discipline. What have other chemists done with wikis or what have other art historians done in terms of using blogs or whatever. And give me a space in which I can share and discuss uh, my design ideas, my learning and teaching ideas. <clears throat> so... Essentially, at the core of learning design are three things, guidance, visualization, and sharing. Um, these pictures, by the way, uh, these slides, a few slides here, are from my colleague Gabby Whithouse, who's actually South African, as uh, some of you may uh, know her. Um, and she um, provides this very nice link in terms of the link towards a more participatory social and mobile web, which has a number of characteristics. Firstly, it's about peer critiquing, the way in which others can comment and share and provide advice on learning and teaching ideas. <clears throat> it's about being part of a community. I mean, the kind of social media tools are really amazing, aren't they, in terms of the ways in which they enable us to interact with people on a global scale. Uh, Leicester is my fifth or sixth in fifth institution, but really I feel more wedded to the global community of researchers that I'm connected with through Twitter, through Facebook, etc. Uh, distance really isn't a boundary now. It's amazing the ways in which we can share um, ideas and get advice. It's about user-generated content, both in terms of teachers creating content or teachers providing a mechanism for learners to create their own contact, content. <coughs> and it's about collective aggregation of content. We all need to be aware, though, that we have a digital identity online. 
and we need to be aware of and clear about what the identity is, how open we are, what kind of tone of conversation we have, how much we share, <clears throat> how much we participate with others. And each of us have a different preference for this. And we really are seeing, as I said before, before a blurring of boundaries. I, I mean, a, a, a webinar like this is amazing to think of you guys all over, dotted all over South Africa, me sitting in a small village in the middle of England um, at the start of spring. So the next slide just asks the questions, do our learning management systems or virtual learning environments, as we call them in the UK, make the most of the potential of the characteristics or affordances of technologies? Typically, um, an online course is created by a teacher, whereas in the future we might shift to content being created by learners. And primarily, <coughs> uh, VLEs are mainly used as content repositories. Most teachers are not really harnessing the power of the affordances um, of the tools that VLEs have. And maybe we need to move to more of a collective creation of content, providing mechanisms for peers, peer critiquing, community formation, etc. So there are a number of questions about how we can better use basic tools that we all have like VLEs, let alone the free social and participatory tools we also have. And really, it, learning design bridges the gap between the future offered by technologies and the existing limitations of our courses. It's about transformation. It's about really thinking about how these technologies can be better utilized to support different pedagogical approaches. The 7 C's framework that I'm going to introduce in a moment um, came out of work that I led at the Open University UK as part of an initiative called uh, OU Learning Design Initiative. And if you, if you Google that, um, you'll find the link to the original website. And Leicester University had been doing something in parallel called Carpe Diem, see today, a series of workshops on learning design. And when I moved to Leicester just over two and a half years ago, we combined the resources and the things that we had from these two initiatives to form uh, the new seven C's of learning design conceptual framework. <clears throat> and learning design is really about helping academics shift from a design approach that's belief-based and implicit to one that's much more design-based and explicit. And we believe that it encourages more reflective scholarly practice and helps to promote sharing and discussing uh, with peers. So the seven C's um, starts with the conceptualization C, which is about creating a vision for the course. What are the higher level principles uh, uh, um, associated with the course? What are the kind of key things that you as designers want uh, to be instantiated into the uh, course? For example, um, an engineering course um, might have uh, a principle about uh, project-based work or team-based work, because engineers ultimately um, will work in uh, professional teams and need to develop those skills. And as part of this conceptualized C, uh, we'll get you looking at something called the course features activity, which will enable you to articulate the higher level principles of your courses. Then we have a series of things around creating resources. Whether that's doing a resource audit of existing free resources, listing them and um, articulating which ones might need to be adapted for your particular context, or whether it's about indicating what resources you might create, whether that's simple text or audio or video. And then there are things uh, to foster good communication and collaboration, the ways in which, for example, you can facilitate an online discussion, the ways in which you can uh, use a wiki as a collaborative shared working space, um, and consider is to do with reflection and um, assessment. So it's about assessing whether the learning outcomes um, have been achieved. And then there are a series of design views uh, which step back, if you like, um, and give you a different view mm. of the design, and will get you to look at a number of those, in particular the activity profile, which enables you to see the mix of different types of activities uh, that the learners will be engaging with, uh, and the storyboard, which provides a kind of temporal sequence of the whole design process. And finally, 
Uh, it's about consolidation. It's about implementing the whole design process in a real learning context and evaluating how effective it is. So for each of these seven Cs, we've developed a range of activities and resources, and you're going to get the chance to work through some of those over the next few, few weeks. I'm now just going to give you a bit of a taster of those and show you uh, some of the activities. So under the conceptual IC, um, there are two particular activities. The course features activity, which you will work through, and the persona activity, which is where you do little uh, imaginary cards, if you like, of anticipating what kind of learners you're going to have on your course. So a first year undergraduate maths course is going to be very different in terms of the learners to a professional practice course or a third level art history course, for example. So articulating the nature of, of, of your learners helps you then ensure that the design is appropriate to those learners. So the vision is about why are you designing, who is it for, and what do you want to design, and it's about, as I said, the key principles and pedagogical approaches and the nature of the learners. So the course features uh, pack um, is available from this link on the site Cloudworks. Uh, you can also have paper packs. Um, you may want to print those out in your teams and use them if, if you're co-located somewhere. And it enables you to articulate what are the kind of pedagogical approaches associated with the course. Is it primarily about dialogic learning? Is it about constructivism? Is it about project-based learning? And then the key principles associated with the course, the nature of the guidance and support you're going to provide uh, for your learners, the kinds of content and activity, uh, the reflection and demonstration, and the forms of communication and collaboration you're going to encourage. So principles might include things like the fact that it's theory-based or it's about applying theory to practice. So, for example, teacher trainers, it would be very much about them applying the learning theories they've learned into a real teaching context. A third-level art history course might have aesthetics associated with it. It might be about enabling the learners to understand and appreciate different kinds of art forms. A history or economics course might have a very uh, political dimension. So there's a kind of whole range of different things um, that are in scope in terms of the principles. And the cards give you some suggestions, but you can also include your own uh, principles if they're not there. For example, in a workshop I ran last year, in um, Australia, uh, there was a lady who was designing a course um, on local Aboriginal culture. So clearly, the local cultural dimensions would be very important um, in that course. Pedagogical approaches might be that the course is inquiry-based. Uh, there's a very nice uh, tool called Enquire. I'll just type it in the box, um, which is a toolkit to foster inquiry-based learning to encourage uh, uh, scientific understanding and inquiry-based learning. It might be that the course fundamentally has a problem at the heart or a case. It might be that you're encouraging dialogic learning. For example, a language course dialogue is one of the key four skills that uh, needs to be gen uh, generated. It might be situative in a particular context. Uh, virtual worlds have been used extensively for this, for example, by mimicking a, a medical ward or an archaeological dig. It might be that collaborative learning is really important and is fostered. Vicarious is an interesting one. This is where learners learn from each other. So one learner would explain key concepts to the other learners. And it might be authentic. So there's a range of pedagogical approaches, and you need to decide which are the key ones uh, for your course. Kinds of guidance and support um, that are possible. You might have a very structured learning pathway. It might be that the learning is scaffolded. Uh, that's a concept from David Woods from Nottingham University, which is where it's quite tightly scaffolded at the beginning. But over in time, as the students become more confident, that scaffolding is, um, uh, is removed. There might be links to study um, uh, support or remedial help. There might be a help desk. Uh, there might be step-by-step -step instruction. Many courses have links to library support, for example. Uh, students may be encouraged to support each other through peer support. 
So you need to decide what are the key aspects of guidance and support you're going to provide. Uh, content and activities uh, might include the following, if I can hit the right button. Uh, it might be that you're getting the students to brainstorm some concepts together and come to some kind of consensus. You might get them uh, concept mapping um, uh, an area. You might get them doing annotated um, notes on a particular set of resources. Uh, jigsaw is interesting. Uh, jigsaw is an approach where you divide a problem into four parts. Mm. Let's say you were getting uh, students to look at different learning theories. Uh, one student might look at associative pedagogies, another constructivism, another mm -hmm. situated, and another connectivist. And each of those four students would go off and research their topic, and then they would come together with others and different teams who had researched the same problem. So all of those that had been looking at associative pedagogies would come together, would share and discuss what they've got, and then they would go back to their home team and combine. So it's a really nice, neat way of dividing a problem into four parts, a really good way of getting students to collaborate. You might get the students aggregating resources. For example, you might have them uh, adding resources on a wiki, for example. Uh, you might get them uh, manipulating data in a spreadsheet, information handling. Or you might get them modeling something, often very important, for example, in the sciences. Mm. Reflection and demonstration. Uh, it might be that you have a diagnostic test at the beginning of your course. For example, if you had a language course, you might want to assess uh, the students' prior learning in terms of language and then divide them into different groups depending on where they are. You might have the assessment, which might be simple multiple choice questions, or you might have an e-portfolio where students demonstrate their evidence of how uh, much they've achieved their learning outcomes. Feed forward is interesting. Feed forward is where you anticipate the problems that students are likely to have, and you give that information um, up front. You might encourage students to extensively reflect on what they're doing. Um, I've done a number of Open University UK Spanish courses, and fundamental to the OU courses is lots of points in the materials which says, now reflect on what you've done. You might get it in doing presentations, either individually or as a group. You might encourage peer feedback um, and, of course, uh, right down to summative um, assessments, including good old exams. <laughs> These are some examples of ways in which you can foster communication and collaboration. You might have um, a structured debate, or you might have a for and against debate. Is global warming really happening? So you might have one team of people saying yes and the other team saying no and articulating why, and maybe then getting the group to... Uh, uh, to vote at the end. You might have a flash debate. Now, that's where a sudden, like, really topical um, issue comes up in a particular area. So if you had geography students, for example, and there was an earthquake, um, I understand from Facebook there was an earthquake in the UK last week, uh, but I missed it. Um, so if you had a sudden earthquake, for example, all the earthquakes that have been happening in New Zealand over the last few years, you might kind of start a debate on that. or in a political or history course, if there was a kind of some, some war conflict in one uh, part of the world, you might get students discussing that. You might get them engaged in some kind of group project uh, or presentations. You might have them peer critiquing each other. Very good use of blogs, for example. So you might ask students to uh, post a blog post and then comment on two other ones. So there's lots of different ways in which you can foster uh, communication and uh, collaboration. The capture C, or the create C as we now call it, is about finding and uh, creating interactive materials. That might be doing an, a resource audit of any existing open educational resources that are there. Uh, for example, you might include YouTube videos, or you might include a YouTube video with a little introduction saying, uh, in this video, focus on such and such and reflect on X. And then also thinking about what materials you need to produce what kind of skills you need to produce them, and how much time it's going to take. And finally, it might be that you're encouraging the learners to generate their own content. And this, is, in particular, is very important in professional practice um, uh, courses, I think. Communicate, uh, ways in which you can foster communication. Gilly Salmon, uh, my predecessor at Leicester, 
of course, developed the e-moderating framework as a way of um, uh, fostering communication in discussion forums. Uh, and there are lots of other ways in which we can moderate. And I know, uh, I can see in the chat here, no doubt Tony and others are keeping an eye on the chat. And at some point, we'll stop. And if there's any kind of uh, questions you want to ask me, uh, we can pick those up from the chat session. So there are different ways in which you can um, foster communication. And it's interesting, if we look at the debate around MOOCs, and in particular C MOOCs, the connect connectivist MOOCs, one of the crit criticisms of them is that often uh, there's not enough uh, support provided to guide the communication and collaboration. So many participants feel at a loss, if you like, because they're not being provided um, with support. Um, OK, so similarly, collaboration. I mentioned the um, jigsaw um, uh, uh, approach. Uh, these are kind of pedagogical patterns if you haven't come across the term before. And kind of structured examples of good practice. And there's a very nice um, article uh, by Peter Goodyear. I'll just type his name in the chat box. Uh, in Ajax in 2005 about pedagogical patterns. Another pattern is the pyramid. Uh, you might get learners um, considering uh, a problem on their own, then working in pairs and discussing and coming to some shared consensus, and then finally uh, voting and coming to a shared consensus as a whole class. There are lots and lots of these different pedagogical approaches around, which are articulating the best of good practice that we know works in terms of fostering different kinds of learning. And then consider, as I said, it's to do with reflection and assessment. Mm. It also includes ensuring that the learning outcomes for the course or the module are aligned to the assessment elements. If a learning outcome isn't uh, linked to the assessment activities, then arguably it isn't there. And either you need to take that learning outcome out, or you need to include something in the assessment which is assess of it. And this is what uh, Biggs refers to as constructive alignment. So I'll just put uh, constructive alignment. And I, if you haven't come across this work before, I would certainly recommend you look at it. And when you're designing learning outcomes, you need to really think about active verbs and really think about active verbs that can genuinely be measured in some way. And assessment, as I said before, includes diagnostic assessment, formative assessment where you give feedback to the learners, summative assessment where it counts towards their uh, final mark, and elements of peer assessment. And they each uh, have different uh, benefits. The combine enables you to step back and look at where you are uh, in your design process. Uh, you'll work through the course view, which enables you to kind of get a higher level holistic picture of the course, uh, follows on nicely from the course features and activity. So this is where you articulate the kinds of guidance and support you're providing the learners, the forms of content and activities they will engage with, the elements of reflection and demonstration of learning, and finally the ways in which communication and collaboration are fostered. As I said before, the activity profile enables you to see how much time learners are spending on different kinds of activities. And the storyboard gives you a kind of overarching picture of the whole um, uh, design process, um, which is, um, is activity-focused rather than content-focused and is a temporal sequence. And finally, consolidate is about putting into uh, practice, into a real um, learning situation, whether that's through your online environment, your virtual learning environment, um, or whether that's in a classroom. And there's a really lovely tool um, called I, uh, ILDE. I'll just type it in here, Tool for Design, uh, which is part of the methods project I'm involved with. And it's a complete environment to, for doing the design process. <clears throat> if you haven't come across that before, I would certainly uh, recommend you have a look. Uh, look. And there are also sites um, for sharing uh, uh, design ideas. Of course, we can use generic social media tools like Facebook or uh, Twitter. But also, there are specialized ones. Um, and at the Open University, we developed one called cloudworks.ac.uk, which is a social networking site uh, for sharing learning and teaching ideas. 
it's free. Um, you can look at it. If you want to contribute, you just need to set up um, a username and password. Uh, we've run literally hundreds and hundreds of these workshops now. I'm delighted to say we ran one face-to-face -face, um, in South Africa, UNISA, in November. And I think we had about 80 participants, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and at various conferences uh, all around the world. And we've, from that, we've been evaluating the resources and improving them um, as we go on. We had funding uh, from JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee in the UK, for a project called Speed, uh, where we evaluated the tools and cascaded them out, if you like, to four institutions in the UK. And these are just some of the quotes from the participants. We made a big break. Through. We have achieved insight about the need to structure it as an online course and not just simply as a set of learning activities plus integrated resources. The visual nature of the tools and the quick and easy way that one can use it, they help stimulate to look at the course in a different way, in a natural and creative way, even if we didn't see all the little mm. links right up front. So we've got lots of evaluations from people and the various workshops we, we run. And it really does seem that these tools help uh, participants be much more creative in their design process, to think beyond content to activities, to be able to articulate and share and discuss their design ideas. More broadly, um, learning design as an area, as I said, has been driven from people in, the, um, in Europe and in um, Australia. And it's emerged over the last 10 years or so as a counter, if you like, counterbalance to the more established field of instructional design. And a group of us have been meeting over the past uh, three years or so to try and articulate what we mean by learning design and how is it distinctive from instructional design. And we came up with a document on this. This is led by James DL from Australia. Uh, he had money from um, the... Um, uh, Association of Learning and Teaching, uh, National Teaching Fellowship in Australia. Um, and we came up with a document that articulated what we meant, which is called the Larnaca Declaration on Learning Design. And there's a link uh, to that document there. So if you want more on the background, the ph philosophical position, if you like, um, of learning design, do um, please have a look at that. Uh, it includes um, the idea about the analogy to music that I mentioned um, earlier on. Uh, also, uh, I've recently produced a book by Springer, uh, which is called um, uh, Designing for Learning in an Open World. Uh, it's way too expensive, but if you're interested, do email me, and um, I can give you a link to the near final uh, PDF of the book. And I'm currently working on another book, uh, which will provide a much more practical set of hands-on guides to design. But, you know, if you like, uh, 101 learning designs to promote different pedagogical approaches. And hopefully that will be out later this year. Uh, I mentioned earlier on uh, ILDI, the learning design, integrated learning design environment. Uh, that's been produced as part of an EU-funded project called METIS, and it provides a complete online environment for designing and indeed implementing a design. Uh, currently that design is... Um, uh, implemented into Moodle, but the hope is in the future that it will be possible to do it for other designs, uh, learning environments as well. So right, I'm going to stop now, and before we engage with the first activity, um, are there any questions from the chat box? So, Tony, um, do, you, do you want to facilitate uh, uh, any questions that you think have emerged? Um, I think there was an interesting question from Rizelle. Uh, will Gronje unpack each concept later on and support us and which would be the right one to use for our students? Trying to um, figure out, how do you figure out and navigate which of the many concepts in this very sophisticated toolkit are going to be the right ones to use for your course? Uh, 
That's a great question. Uh, one of the things we realized early on is that design is a creative, messy, iterative, and very highly individual process. Um, it's not linear. It doesn't start with pedagogies and learning outcomes and go through. It's all over the place. So we might be thinking, oh, I want to integrate these resources, or I want to encourage the students to do to engage in dialogue, or I want to promote problem-based learning, or what have you. So we have a variety of questions <clears throat> and motivations, if you like, to guide us um, through the design process. And it's always ongoing. Um, so what we've done with the seven Cs is we've created a whole set of resources and activities. And really, it's up to individuals to choose which they find useful. So some, a lot of people, for example, find the course features activity really, really useful. Not everybody lo likes the activity profile. So really, what you're going to get over the next few week, weeks is a taster of these different resources. And then you can go back to the ones that you find useful and use them more. Not everybody will use um, all of the resources. It's very much an individual approach. And it's also about your own interpretation of those as well. And at different stages in the design process, uh, you'll use different tools. So as I said, the course features is great because, because it provides you with that higher level articulation of the vision for the course. And then things like the course view enables you to dig into more detail and the resource audit to articulate what you're going to include. Does that um, answer the question, do you think? That's up to Lizelle to say. But what I'm wondering about also is something that Catherine said that touched on the issue of messiness. When Catherine said that as people um, with responsibility for particular courses, we are held accountable if there are errors in the content. So um, that the kind of collaborative process that you're describing and inviting us to requires a fair amount of trust. So we relinquish a certain amount of control um, and let other people into the process, even if there are perhaps some perceived risks. Yeah, those are very good points. Um, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things we're trying to do, is we've done activities um, when I was initially researching these things. And I did a number of things. One, I interviewed teachers to find out how they go about their design process, where they got ideas, how they shared, if they shared. And we also found that actually it's very difficult to articulate your design it's in your head. It's actually quite hard to articulate it and share it with other, others. So the design views that um, you'll be engaging with the next few weeks looks at the design process from different, um, from different aspects. As I said, higher level holistic uh, views, if you like, like the course features down to uh, articulating the resources that you're going to uh, incorporate or, um, or create. And uh, it is very valuable to work in teams to be able to have a shared co-construction of the design process because you learn from others so much more and having to articulate your design decisions to others helps you clarify more um, of what you're doing. So th I, I think that's how I would answer it. The other interesting thing is um, how this process could be perhaps incorporated into institutional uh, uh, course approval processes. Um, Currently, course approval processes are very much admin focused. It would be really nice to have these design views incorporated so that uh, from the very beginning, course teams start to articulate their design practices and, and sharing those. And, um, and, and why not even share them with the learners? Uh, many courses are just uh, mm. descriptions are very much just text based. Wouldn't it be nice to give learners an indication of the kind of activities and the time they're going to spend on different things to give them an idea of what the vision for the course were and what are the core principles, etc. Any other questions, Tony? I'm sure there are plenty of other questions. Um, those seem to be the two most 
um, obvious questions in the chat, but perhaps here we are, here we're coming up. Um, there is a basic underlying assumption that the teacher is responsible for the learning of the student, which he believes to be a harmful and misguided notion. Hinders um, the development of independent <coughs> learners. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think teaching and learning are closely integrated. And, and it's a partnership, isn't it? Um, it's not all about the teacher. Uh, it is about the learners as well. Um, and it will depend not only on the types of learners, but on the nature of the subject discipline. So independent learning may be very important in some disciplines, but not in others. So if you take um, a first year undergraduate science course, for example, that is fundamentally probably going to be quite teacher directed, very much because of the nature of the content. And it will be about um, guiding the learners through the process on understanding core concepts. Constructivism doesn't work in a first level science course, in my view. Whereas if it's a third level history course, where one of the principles you're wanting to promote is independent thinking and critical thinking, then you may well engage uh, the learners in quite independent study. You may well uh, put in place activities that enable them to uh, see historical events from different perspectives and to critique on these different views. So there is a close link, I think, between the learners, the nature of the subject, and the core vision of the teachers involved. Okay, it doesn't look like there are any more questions surfacing immediately. Maybe it's time to move on to the disruptive learning activity. Great. Okay. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, the first activity is what's called how to ruin a course. Yes, it is how to ruin, not um, how to run. So what I'd like you to do is list the 10 ways in which technologies can ruin a course. What are the 10 things that you can guarantee will make a course fail? And then what you're going to do is then turn that on its head and think about the ways in which you could avoid um, uh, these problems. So Tony, back to you. Do you want to say a little bit about where people do this and how they do it? Well, what I'm thinking is that it might be a good idea to just use the chat here because this is the space where we are. And okay. to um, start off by a very quick brainstorm of ways you can use technology to absolutely and totally ruin a course. And then we'll get on to strategies. Great. I just enter those in the chat. Yeah, so people could start to just enter in their thoughts. And perhaps afterwards, Tony or somebody, we could just um, cut and paste what those are. Using an inaccessible tool, absolutely. Great. Um, difficult to access, yeah. Or confusing instructions. Uh, not scaffolding. Too many tools, absolutely. That's a key one. It, you know, if, if you have like multiple ways in which people can um, communicate, students are going to get very confused. Mobile devices are now very important. I totally agree. So uh, it really is good if, um, of course, it's mobile ready. Gosh, there's lots going here. I can't read them all. It's going too fast. <laughs> Help is very important. Absolutely, being able to. Too many logins, a big issue. Um, uh, tools not working. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the learning outcomes need to be core. Um, yeah, yeah, facilitation is key. And that's one of the issues with um, MOOCs. Um, they're not or, or, or often facilitated. And facilitation is important in terms of motivation and keeping students on track and um, also important in terms of retention. You know, feeling that actually, you know, whoever's leading the course is actually listening to what the students are doing. Distracting chats, yeah, uh, yeah. You really need to think nowadays about what technologies you're using and, and why. Because learners are very astute and strategic, and they won't do things if they can't see the benefits for them. So you need to make it very clear to them why exactly the purpose, why are they using their tools. Wow, these are great points. And the design views will help you think about that. Yeah, and in blended courses, it's really important to ensure that you think about what you're doing in the 
uh, online space and what they're doing in the classroom. And there's the concept of um, um, uh, uh, the flipped classroom, of course. I'm just going to put a link also in the chat uh, to a very nice project in Australia called the Spaces for Knowledge Generation Project, which looked at um, how you can technology enable real physical spaces to really make them technology enhanced. And it's got a set of seven guiding design principles. It's really, really excellent in terms of simple things like having flexible desks and chairs. You can configure the room in different spaces, making sure you have plug sockets in the, in the right places, etc. And there's a very nice um, accessible final um, report that I can thoroughly recommend for you, which is uh, linked from that page. Yeah, digital literacy is key because Although learners today are immersed in technology and can't imagine a world without Google, uh, they don't necessarily have the right kind of digital academic literacy skills um, that they need. And just as in the old days we would have to teach them how to read an academic book, uh, we now really need them uh, to give them advice and guidance on how they can use the internet appropriately uh, for um, for their learning, how they can evaluate whether resources are are, are relevant, etc. There's a nice um, uh, paper by Jenkins et um, al. Uh, on digital literacies. They list seven uh, literacies that are needed. Uh, I think it's 2006. So if you Google uh, that, uh, you should find the uh, resource. So that's. Um, I'll just see if I can find it. Uh, Yeah, got it. So this is a link to the, the digital literacy course. Yeah. Make sure the technology fails randomly. Yeah. I mean, nowadays, of course, technology is more and more robust. And, and that's a problem because learners expect the technologies to work. Um, so it's a big issue. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's true. A lot of learners don't want um, teachers in their spaces, in their social spaces. They don't want Facebook pages necessarily. And learners have very different views um, uh, of, of, of different social media. Some people love them, some people hate them. And you need to take that into account. Is sound a problem? Can you not hear me? Oh, great. Fantastic. Yeah, being too proud is key. Uh, that can be an issue both for learners and for teachers. Great. Glad you can hear me OK. So I think that's probably enough on that, um, if you're happy. Uh, OK. Hi, Alice. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, and, and this is being recorded as well. Um, so obviously what you can do with that list is you could then prioritize what you think are the key issues um, and then turn it around and say, OK, well, if this is an issue, how am I going to address it? Um, what can I do to ensure that it's not um, a, a problem? So if you're OK, um, Tony, I suggest we move on. Is that OK? Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, and how long how long more should we aim to go on for, Tony? Well, we originally agreed to go on until the hour. Um, however, if you want to stay a bit longer and have a more free-flowing conversation, um, it's then up to participants as to whether or not everyone wants, anyone, anyone else wants to stay. But I'm sure many will. Sure, that's great. OK. So, um, I've got this slide in the wrong wrong place. I should have had it before the activity. Um, the seven C's uh, that I uh, outlined for you is a new design process, as I say, a new design framework which has been developed from the work of the Open University UK and Leicester. And it guides you through the process of conceptualizing the design and representing it. Uh, Evaluation has been very positive overall, and it does help teachers to be uh, more creative. But as I said earlier, you could also use these with learners. Why not to give them more of a 
indication of what the nature of the course is. Um, and we're continually refining the uh, framework based on, uh, on feedback. And feedback from you guys um, uh, would be very much welcome. So now um, I'd like to move on to the course features uh, activity. Uh, there's a link to the resources for this at the bottom of the page there. Uh, and as I said before, it consists of a, a paper pack um, which guides you through a number of aspects. The principles of the course, the pedagogical approaches, the forms of guidance and support, the nature of the content and activities the learners will engage with, the kind of communications and collaborations in scope, and the forms of reflection and demonstration. So if you can, it would be very good to print out uh, this pack, and then you can just sort, as you can see a team's doing here, you can either just put the ones that you think are key for the course, or you can put um, the cards into three columns, where the first column are the cards that are totally in score from really fundamental for the course, the second are features that are there to some extent, minor features, and the third, which are things that are completely out of scope. So, for example, uh, for a completely online UNISA course, obviously there would be no uh, uh, classroom-based, um, campus-based uh, courses. Uh, other courses may be blended in nature or what have you. And as I said before, use these cards as guidance to guide your design process, um, but don't feel limited by them um, in any way. Um, feel free to add in your own elements. And if some things don't mean anything, to then just ignore them, that's absolutely fine. So I don't know quite how we want to do this. This might be a good point to uh, stop, but before I do so, let me just run through the remaining activities. And I think we have a timeline of suggestions for when you do the activities by. And as we said before, we would really strongly uh, encourage you to work in teams. You'll get much more out of the workshop if you work in teams. So this is the course features activity. And it would be good to spend a kind of good hour or so on this, if not longer. Um, then there's an activity to do with looking at and articulating what you think uh, forums, blogs, and wikis are particularly good for. Um, what's the benefit of discussion forums over blogs or wikis, for example? And you might like to, in your team, uh, brain uh, storm those. And on the next slide, I've got some examples which were collected from uh, previous workshops. Discussion forums, because of their asynchronous uh, nature, are particularly good for reflection. Uh, um, blogs can be very good for individual reflection. Uh, wikis can be very effective for um, uh, collaboration. So that's another activity you might like to come up with your own list of what you think the pros and cons of those different discussion forums are. The next activity, and again, there's a link at the bottom of this page, is what we call the resource audit. So this will help you uh, to articulate what free resources you might use and to what extent you need to repurpose them, and also to list what new resources you want to create, which might include an indication of how long you think that's going to take and what kind of skills level um, you're going to need. And there are lots of free tools available for um, uh, creating uh, audio uh, and video, for example. The course map uh, builds on nicely um, from the course features, and it enables you to list in detail the tools and resources that you're going to include for um, guidance and support, for the nature of the content and activities, reflection and demonstration, and communication and collaboration. And in that, you can also indicate some uh, things like you might have a diagnostic test in there, and then you might indicate uh, the purpose of the diagnostic test is to assess uh, learners' knowledge at the, and skills at the beginning of the course, or whatever it might be. It might be that you've got a link to remedial math uh, support for a first-level math course, for example. Uh, and then the next activity uh, is the activity profile, and this enables you to articulate how much time the learners are spending on different types of activities. So the first um, uh, column is assimilative activities. That's reading something, listening to something, viewing something. The second is information handling. 
for example, manipulating data in a spreadsheet. The third is how much time they're spending communicating. The fourth is productive in terms of how much time they're spending producing something, might be a chemical compound or an architectural model. The next is experiential, drill and practice, work-based learning, for example. The next is adaptive. That's quite a specialized type of activity, but very important, particularly in the sciences. So this is things like modeling or simulation. So you might, in physics, have a simulation of a pendulum and enable the learners to alter the variables and see the effect on the swing of the pendulum. And then finally, how much time they're spending on the assessment elements of the course. And this is available online from Cloudworks as a widget. You can add rows and enter the amount of time for each of those, and then it gives you that red profile. Or it's also available um, as a, an Excel spreadsheet. And finally, uh, we get to the storyboard. Uh, as I said before, this is a temporal sequence. At the top, you list the time frames, like you can see here in this example, I've got four weeks worth of activities. And then you list the topics that are covered. And then you list the learning outcomes down the side. And then in the center, you have the activities that the students are engaging with. And you can see that in week one, for example, they're watching a video and reading a document. In week two, they're reading a document and listening to a podcast. And in the final two weeks, they're listening to another podcast, another video, and a document. And then below, you list the outputs the students produce. So in week one, it might be um, an essay, an individual essay. In week two, it might be a blog post. And in week three, it might be a group presentation and a reflective article on their learning. And then you put against those uh, the assessment elements. So it might be in week one, the teacher provides formative feedback on the um, document the student produces. In week two, it might be uh, students peer critique each other's blog posts, and in week three it might be a summative, uh, week three and four, sorry, it might be a summative assessment where um, on the group presentation and the reflective log. And finally, you just check that all of the learning outcomes are mapped. Um, as I said, uh, Biggs's concept of uh, constructive alignment. So this really is like the finale to all the design processes before, and it helps you in one sheet to map this out. Now, Either you can do this on a big sheet of A, A4, uh, sorry, A3, or um, there is an online tool, uh, Linoit, uh, which you might want to use, which is like a, a, an equivalent of um, a sticky notes, online sti virtual sticky notes, where you could, you could use that to structure your design process. Really, it's up to you. If you do it on paper, uh, we would encourage you to take a picture and um, load them online. There are different spaces in the forums uh, for the different activities you'll be uh, engaging with. So that's the storyboard. There's the link to the actual um, activity to help develop the storyboard for your module uh, and ensure that learning outcomes are aligned with the assess assessment elements. And finally, uh, you might like to think about brainstorming some criteria for how you're going to evaluate how successful the course is. For example, if you one of your principles was to encourage dialogic learning, you might want to look at the course and see how much um, activities are happening in the discussion forum, for example, and try and make them as measurable as, pos uh, as possible. Um, and then we'll also put a space in the discussion forum at the end when we come back uh, in a month or so's time to the final uh, synchronous session uh, to getting you to articulate what you liked about the course, what could be improved, what three words you would use to describe the course and any um, associated action plans um, as a result. Uh, how much time you spend on, on these activities is really up to you. You might just spend um, a, a very short amount of time, or in, in some that you find particularly useful, you might find you want to spend more time. Really, this is just a taster to give you a feel for the um, resources. Uh, if you find them useful, you can then go back and use them uh, in, in more anger. So we'll come back to these um, at the end of the course. And I just wanted to point you here to some useful resources. Uh, we will, of course, make, make these slides available. Uh, and finally, uh, to mention uh, some contact details, if I can get to the final slide. Hmm. 
I can't seem to get to the final slide. <laughs> um, I'm G Canole on Twitter, uh, and I'm G Canole at gmail.com uh, is my email. I don't know why I can't get to the final slide, but never mind. Okay, I, I, we've just gone over the hour, so I'm going to stop and hand back to you, Tony, uh, for any final questions or any final thoughts. And, of course, I'm very happy to stay online for a while to chat more informally with people. Gronia, thank you very much for leading us into the workshop um, in a way that communicates both a wonderful sense of the big picture as well as how the different parts of the process fit together. Um, so I'm certainly very excited about this workshop and I can see that many of our participants from the chat also um, are mobilizing a lot of energy around this design process. Um, okay, in the course of today and in fact by the middle of this meeting um, we had sent out new access details for the EmergeAfrica.net live website to everyone who wasn't already a member of the site, although I know several people here already are members of the site. So um, use those access details, come to the site, come into the forums, introduce yourself, start engaging with some of the activities in the forums. Um, We'll also go to the Learning Design Group's Google Doc, where at the moment I see there are currently um, 12 groups which have been formed. Um, please add your groups to this. We'll also create forum spaces for you for each of your groups on the EmergeAfrica.net live site. Of course, you're welcome to create any other spaces that you want for yourselves. Um, in any other environment, including face-to-face -face meetings with the people who are co-located in the same organizations. So, um, and, and I believe there are a couple of questions that have been coming up in the, um, in the chat still, and there may be a couple of people who want to continue talking more informally after this. But I think at this point, we probably should um, stop recording and move on to the rest of the workshop.